Good morning. <laughs> uh, I'm Michael Taylor. I'm excited to have the opportunity to share with you here this morning. Thanks for all, all of you for coming out at the barn and for all of you joining us online. Um, I was thinking back to this summer when I took my son Gideon camping. Uh, he's six years old, and so we, we went camping for a night at my grandma's house. She's got a little bit of uh, a little bit of land, a little bit of woods there, and taking him camping brought back all of these memories of my childhood because I don't I don't think there's anything better in my childhood than spending time at grandma's house. Uh, you know, she had some woods we could play and explore in the woods. Uh, just roaming around the property, there was a little pool we could swim in, and my personal favorite. Uh, a cookie jar that never seemed to run out of cookies. I do like cookies. Um, and so I was really excited to share all of this with Gideon. And, and one of the interesting things I noted was that he wasn't as excited about some of the things that I was excited about. I mean, the woods was just kind of a place to him. And, you know, he's, he thought, well, cookies are okay and all, but we've got a fire here. We should be making s'mores. Forget about the cookies. And it, it made me think, well, maybe what, what Gideon is revealing is that those uh, perfect days that I remember back from my childhood, maybe it wasn't really all that I remembered that it was. You know, I, I think then when I thought more about it, I thought, you know, there were plenty of times when I was at Grandma's house just sitting around saying, I'm bored. There's nothing to do here. And, you know, being a, being a child has its own set of anxieties, and it feels like you're constantly being told no, or at least I feel like I'm constantly saying no to my child. No, you can't do that. No, you can't go there. There's uh, restrictions in where you can go, what you can do, rules that you have, uh, punishment for not following the rules. And so my memory was a bit incomplete. And I was thinking about this because I feel like during this year of 2020 and this fog that we've been talking about in this series, I've heard countless times people saying, you know, when things go back to normal, or when this is all over. Have you said that or heard someone say that? I heard it over and over again, and it's, it's starting to, to die out a little bit here, but uh, uh, at the longer things go on. But there's this sense that if things would just go back to the way they were, then everything would be easy and perfect and uh, we would have no problems. But when I think back to 2019, I don't really remember sitting around thinking, this is the perfect situation. If 2019 would just continue forever, then everything would be great for the rest of my life. Because 2019 had its own set of problems. And in fact, some of the things we thought were problems back then got solved this year. I mean, how many people would have said, that they wanted to spend more time with their family in the upcoming year, less time at work, more time eating at home to be healthier, more involvement in your kids' lives. I mean, these are things we would have said and we got it a lot more than we wanted to get. <laughs> but we got it. But 2019 had its own set of problems and, and the next year is gonna have its set, you know, working to build a marriage, raising kids, um, dealing with family and just the ongoing challenges of struggling with those deep-seated sins and attitudes and behaviors that we're always trying to, to work out. And I, this is true you know, spiritually as well. Even if you're really clicking on all cylinders in 2019, we don't wanna just say that we go back to where we were, but we wanna be looking forward and saying that I am different and more mature spiritually uh, forward than I was in the past. And so what I want to talk about today is how this rear view look, going back, doesn't clear out the fog, but the only way is to look forward and to cut through the fog to bring clarity. And the only effective way to do that is to turn to the Lord and behold his glory. So that's what I want to, want to look at today. And I'm going to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to be in the third chapter in verse 12, and we're going to look at an example there of a foggy time. The Apostle Paul lays out a foggy time and then he shows us the path out of that. And so you can read along with me if you want on your devices or, or Bibles. Um, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. We're going to go verse 12 through 18. And so this is the Apostle Paul writing here and he starts out, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. 
And so this is the first clue of what we should have our eyes set on. Paul says that we, as Christians, should have a hope that should make us bold. And that hope is in Jesus Christ, who has died for us, who has resurrected for us and brought us life through his spirit that lives within us. And so that is what we should have our eyes set on. In contrast, here he draws, he draws an, an, a contrast with a picture from the Old Testament. And in verse 13 he says, Not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. And so the word veil is used three times here, and if you think about a veil, it's kind of like a foggy view. If there's a veil over someone, you can't quite see clearly, and they can't quite see clearly out of it. And, and in the Old Testament, there was a literal veil that Moses put over his face because the people were afraid of the glory of God that was shining on Moses' face. And it tells us why here in verse 14, it says their minds were hardened. That the whole idea throughout the book of Exodus is God had delivered his people from slavery. And they were in the desert and they were supposed to learn how to trust him. But their, but their, um, but their minds were hardened. They're called a stiff-necked people in the book of, book of Exodus. And time after time, they find themselves in these foggy type of situations. And they run into trouble. They get out in the desert and they realize they're thirsty. And so they start to grumble. And then they're hungry and they start to grumble. And then they're thirsty again. Because, and they start to grumble. And time after time, God provides for them and wants them to learn to rely on him. But they struggle with it, caught up in the fogs that they're in. And they even romanticize the past, just like I was talking about. They say, oh man, how great was it when we were back in Egypt and we could sit by the meat pots and eat bread. Like they were, they were saying that it would be better to go back into literal slavery than to be out and to trust God. And so, clearly, we know that, that's, we know that that is not an effective, way, uh, an effective way through because Paul tells us here that the only way out of those foggy type situations is with Christ. He says uh, that that veil only, uh, is only lifted um, when it's taken away by Christ. And what Paul says here in, in verse 15 is that even to this day, those situations like we're going on with God's people all the way back in Exodus, even today we're in foggy situations where, think, where troubles come up and you look around and you try to look back and all you see is fog because the only way to see clearly through that is with Jesus. And so that's what Paul lays out here in verse 16. He says that when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So when we turn to the Lord, we repent of the direction that we were headed in, that that veil, that fogginess is removed. In verse 17, he says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So when we turn to the Lord, we can see clearly and we can see freely. And this is one of those ways that you can tell if you've been caught up in the fog by whether you are free or not a lot of people right now are feeling trapped in the fog with fear anxiety and an irritation that won't seem to go away confusion uh being caught up in the unfair circumstances that seem to be happening to us but paul says that when you turn to the lord that you have a freedom a freedom to enjoy the peace that comes with knowing, knowing the Lord, a, a freedom to sit in his uh, presence and be content, to experience his joy, to have an abundance in serving God. And so um, in verse 18, Paul tells us that with that freedom, looking to the Lord, that there is a transformation. He says in verse 18 that we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So first, he says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It removes that veil. And once that veil is gone, we are free to behold the glory of the Lord. 
And when we behold the glory of the Lord, it has a transformative impact on us. This, uh, the word beholding here is used in the sense of reflecting. It's like looking in a mirror and seeing the reflection. But what we see is not our own reflection because our own reflection won't do anything for us. What we see here is the reflection of the Lord, uh, the Lord's glory reflecting back on us and transforming us. I think we all know this in some intuitive type of sense. The things that we fix our eyes on, the things that we spend our time looking at are the things that we start to reflect back. I mean, I just think of like in my office, someone starts saying an expression and then all of a sudden everyone is saying it. One person started saying, you know, it just is what it is. Every conversation, that was the end. And then all of a sudden everyone is saying it and you're thinking, it is not, it is what it is. Can you just stop saying that? Uh, but that's the impact that it has when, when we're surrounded and, and looking at certain things. And the same thing happens here when we behold the glory of Christ. It says here that degree by degree, day by day, that it transforms us more and more into that image of God that we were created in. And the more and more we see that, the more and more clarity that we have that takes us above the fall. And this all happens, he says, from the Lord who is the Spirit, by that, that reflection coming back at us and the inner working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, I, w- I was thinking about this concept. I, I read a book recently by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell. And in this book, he has a chapter about this guy called Gary Cohn. And he's a guy, the, he was a guy that was born in Northeast Ohio in the Cleveland area. And he was one of these kids that growing up was a real problem child. He was disruptive in school, always seemed to be getting in trouble, failed a grade. His mother was worried that he was just, he was not going to make it. She based, she told him uh, that she'd be happy if he just made it out of high school and could at least drive a truck. Basically, didn't want him in her basement for the rest of his life. And so he struggled through school and he finally made it through, uh, finally made it through school. He got a low level kind of going nowhere type of job and he decided, you know what? I want to get to Wall Street. That's where all the action is. And so he takes a train, heads down to Wall Street, and just starts looking around, figuring out, how can I get a job down here? And he's looking around, and he sees an important-looking businessman running out of a building. And he tells, uh, with his assistant in tow, saying, hey, i got to go to LaGuardia. I'll call you when I get there. And he thinks, this is my chance. And he runs up to the guy, and he says, hey, you're going to LaGuardia? I'm going to LaGuardia, too. Can I share a cab with you? And so he gets in the cab and he thinks, this is my opportunity to get, this is my opportunity in. I got an hour with this guy in traffic to convince him to give me a job. And so this well-dressed, important-looking man turned out to be an important man who was a big wig on Wall Street, and he was starting something called options trading. And he said, I have no idea what that is. Gary, do you have any idea what options trading is? And Gary Cohn, of course, said, I know everything about option trading. What do you need to know? Just let me, let me know and I'll do it for you. And so, by the end of the cab ride, he has an offer for a job interview. And so he goes home, and he immediately finds a textbook on options trading, and starts reading on it because he had no idea what options trading was. And he reads painstakingly slow, because it takes him two or three times the normal pace to read and comprehend something. And he figures it out, he goes, he nails the job interview, he uh, makes a ton of money, he does a great job, he gets promoted, 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 eventually makes his way to the big banks and becomes president of Goldman Sachs. And the reason that this story is highlighted in the book is because Gary Cohn had dyslexia. And what is suggested in the book is that maybe Gary Cohn didn't triumph and get to the heights of his profession in spite of his dyslexia, but maybe it was actually because of it, that that, those challenges that he faced in his life actually had a desirable impact. They forced him to develop skills that might have otherwise lain dormant in him. him. Because he was dyslexic, he couldn't read as well as others, so he had to learn different skills, uh, like listening and being more in tune to people and studying people and being reliant for areas where he was weak, things that might have led him to be able to build a successful team. He had to be an outside-the-box thinker because when you don't learn like everyone else, you have to learn how to think differently than everyone else. And 
someone whose mother just hoped that he would be able to get a job and move out of her basement, what does that person have to lose by jumping in a cab and pretending that he knows about option trading? I mean, no one thought he was going anywhere anyway. And so I think, and then so this, this book goes on to lay out successful entrepreneur, entrepreneur and famous person and businessman that became successful and also had dyslexia. And so the question that's posed is, would you choose to have your child be dyslexic because of the opportunity that might give them to be one of these super successful people? And almost every dyslexic that was interviewed said, no, of course not. I would never want my child to have to go through those challenges that I did. But I think that's actually the wrong question to ask because you don't get to choose whether your child is dyslexic or not. That's the way their brain develops. What you get to choose is how you respond to it and whether it becomes a difficulty that's desirable or undesirable because plenty of people have dyslexia and struggle their whole lives and it is a constant struggle that they never overcome. And so I think about that in the context of 2020 and this fog that feels like it's beset us and asking would I have wanted the year 2020 to happen the way it did is not really a relevant question. We, no one chose for COVID to happen, it just it happened here. And the question that we have to ask is how we're gonna respond to it. Is it gonna be a desirable challenge in our lives or an undesirable challenge? And so I would submit that the way that we answer that question has everything to do with what we behold and what reflects back on us. And if we choose to behold the circumstances that we find ourselves here, to live in the daily statistics, the constant news cycle, the hyper-political landscape, choose to behold the enraged comments on social media, or just choose to escape into Netflix binging or sports, or choose to just dwell on the circumstances that just don't seem fair, or think back to the good old days that maybe weren't actually that good, uh, that we will actually lose that freedom that Paul was talking about and become enveloped in the fog. But if this fog of 2020 is something that forces us to dig deep, to behold that glory of God, that it might be something that causes us to learn and grow in ways that we could have never imagined, to exercise spiritual muscles that we didn't know that we had, to... Uh, to learn things in difficulty about the grace and the kindness and the mercy of God, to learn what it means to dig in and do something uncomfortable in the name of Christ. Because the more we behold, the more his light reflects back on us, the more it cuts through the fog and transforms us day by day. And so as we close out this uh, series on cutting through the fog and seeking clarity, my encouragement for all of us is that we will behold the glory of God and allow his light to reflect back on us and provide, provide that clarity. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, what does that look like for us? You know, it probably means that we're going to have to turn off beholding some things. You know, for me, one of the things that I had to turn off was the political commentary. It was just getting to be too much for me in an unhealthy way. And maybe for some people it's, it's tuning down the social media or the daily COVID tracking or political news or whatever it is that, is that you are beholding that is dragging you into the fog. And then it means turning to, uh, turning to other things. You know, uh, a couple weeks ago, Seth recommended that we could read a chapter of the Bible in three to seven minutes with a standard deviation of some number I don't remember. But I think that is a great way to behold. Every day I'm going to read a chapter of the Bible. That's, that's an awesome way to behold on a daily basis. Uh, maybe it's beholding in our prayer life. Uh, maybe you've gotten away from prayer and it's just getting back to it on a regular basis. Or maybe if you have been praying, it's thinking a little bit differently about your prayer. Focusing on things like his will be done and not my will be done. Or maybe it's scheduling a deliberate focused devotional time that two or three times a week I'm going to spend 5, 10, 
15 minutes just alone with a Bible in a quiet place, me and God, his word open, my heart open, beholding and praying to him and reading his word. Or maybe for some of us, it's a challenge to do something a little bit uncomfortable and spend some time with another person. That maybe sharing God's glory is the thing that will get you into a better place in beholding. A phone call, a, a Zoom meeting, a text, some, something like that, that there are probably plenty of people in our congregation that you haven't seen in a while, just given everything that's been going on. So maybe it's just an opportunity to reach out to give yourself a chance to take your eyes off of the circumstances that we find ourselves in and put them on God. Because when we when we do this, when we behold that glory of God, the Bible tells us here that we will get clarity. That's the only sure way to clarity. I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you that you shine your glory down on us, that you provide the answers that truly matter the the way to um to address the conditions and the circumstances that we're in that we know that looking to you that fixing our eyes on you is the way that we go through that whatever things that are happening in our lives that beholding you fixing our eyes on you is the way toward that uh clarity and enjoying the peace that comes with being with you and knowing you lord and we pray that for everyone here today and watching us, that they could know you in that deeper and deeper way. And we love you, Jesus, and pray in your name. Amen.